All right, we're going to get started on module three. Hopefully the mic's working. I'm in a little bit of trouble with the laser pointer, so if you're getting this, uh, I don't know if you have air, some more batteries. Uh, in the meantime, I'll excuse the kiosk here. Okay, so uh, corporations module three is going to deal with corporate form and corporate formation. So here we're going to talk about some of the basics about how to create and think about creating a company. So when we think about creating a company, we think first about what kind of relationships we want to create between the parties. Is the relationship one of joint owners? Is it one of a lender and a borrower? Is it one of two employees, uh, or sorry, an employer uh, hiring an employee? Uh, those different relationships will create different structures for us. So for example, if they're joint owners, it might make sense to have a partnership. A lender-borrower, create a corporation and have it issue uh, you know, debt securities to, uh, to a bank or maybe a personal loan. Employer-employee, again, is going to be different because here you're going to have some built-in agency principles and some employment law issues. So there are many choices, but I'm going to talk just about four today. So we have general partnerships, limited partnerships, corporations, and limited liability companies. We'll get into detail on all of this. A general partnership is the simplest because it's created by default. You don't have to file anything with the state to create a general partnership. And you don't actually need a general partnership agreement. It happens to exist sometimes by accident, uh, which can upset some parties who enter into a relationship and have duties that they didn't expect to take on. So uh, as a practice point, it really is best if people are thinking about going into business together to codify it in a meaningful way. But if they can tell, you end up in this general partnership structure. And in a general partnership, each partner has unlimited liability for the debts and torts of the company, meaning that if either the partner in the course of doing uh, company business uh, injures somebody, either of the partners can be liable. You could have their house taken or, uh, or their, um, uh, you know, their assets uh, seized in order to pay for uh, that tort injury by the other partner. So again, entering into a general partnership by accident can result in liability that you may not want to experience. So one solution is a limited partnership where you have to make a state filing and get into a partnership agreement, otherwise you're simply going to be governed by default rules of your state. Uh, just like corporations, as I mentioned in the previous two modules, uh, partnerships are also creatures of state law. And so the state law is going to be paramount in determining the rights and responsibilities of members of the corporation to each other and to the world. So the limited partnership, you have two kinds of members. Limited partners who have limited liability, meaning they're only liable up to the amount that they have invested in the company. Uh, with the exception of some types of what we would call veil piercing in a corporate context. But in general, they're limited liability to the amount they've invested. And general partners who have unlimited liability. So when do we see limited partnerships? We see them often in funds. Why funds? Well, the limited partners who don't need to necessarily manage the day-to-day -day affairs but just want to make a return on their money will invest as limited partners. And the general partners who take responsibility will manage the day-to-day -day operations of the fund. Often, in that case, the general partner will itself be a limited partnership or, as we'll see, a limited liability company. And in that way, the, ma the managers of the fund also enjoy limited liability. This course primarily regards corporations, and that's what we'll focus on once we review the alternatives. Uh, the corporation is formed by filing a certificate of incorporation in the state of incorporation, and then it may file an S election to be what's called a flow-through entity. So one way corporations are distinguished from the other entities in the beginning of this lecture here, is that corporations pay double taxation. They'll pay a corporate level tax on profits, and then when the profits are distributed to shareholders, they also pay tax on the dividends. Uh, if you make an S election, the corporation operates as a flow-through entity, as I defined in module two. A limited liability company is a type of hybrid between a partnership and a corporation. It's a relatively new creation, and there are two ways that they can be established. They can be member-managed or manager-managed. A member-managed LLC looks like a partnership. There, there can be different classes of members, so you can have class A, class B, but assuming you have one class of members, they all have some kind of voting right and responsibility. Uh, whereas in a manager-managed LLC, there is a group of people called the managers that act like the board of directors of a corporation and run the affairs. And then the members uh, may look a lot more like limited partners in a limited partnership who don't have as much management rights, may have no management rights, and receive just the, the proceeds from their investment or may have some other responsibilities or obligations. So whether you have a member managed or manager managed LLC really is important because a manager managed LLC looks and feels a lot like a corporation. A member managed LLC looks and feels a lot like a partnership. So what should we think about when we create a company? Well, some of the things to think about would be liability for the parties. 
tax issues, whether double taxation is an issue or not, voting rights, whether the people who participate want to have a say in how things are done, whether it should be managed by the members voting as a whole, whether it should be managed by professional managers, managed by outside people, inside people, interested people, how it's going to be capitalized, where the money's coming from, whether it's going to be capitalized by stock or by debt, uh, what the liquidity is, whether or not the members want to be able to, or the constituents want to be able to sell their shares and get their money back, or whether they're in it for the long haul, whether they expect to get profits, or whether they expect to uh, sell their shares at some point because the company's increased in value. What are the key documents that we look at? So the key documents for a corporation uh, would be the Certificate of Incorporation, also known as the Articles of Incorporation in some states, uh, which should be filed, and that creates the corporation. It's typically filed by someone who is called the incorporator. Uh, the incorporator is often the attorney in charge. The attorney will then resign and appoint the directors, actually appoint the directors first and then resign in a document called the Action by Incorporator. Then the directors will make their first resolutions in what's called the organizational resolutions, where they set up the company. They usually at that point also appoint the CEO, CFO, secretary, other officers and issue restricted stock. Uh, the organizational resolutions will also adopt the bylaws, which are the rules that govern the corporation. And then you'll have the employee sign in employee uh, <coughs> employment uh, convention assignment agreement and comp an employee. Excuse me. We're going to have the employee sign in an employee invention assignment and confidentiality agreement so that all the property that they create becomes property of the company and they'll also. Uh, going to receive stock, uh, founders will receive common stock through a restricted stock purchase agreement usually, which um, depending on its terms might have vesting, which we talked about in module two, but essentially if it has vesting, the restricted stock can be repurchased by the company for a period of time so that the founders uh, need to stay with the company in order to receive the benefit. So how does shareholder voting work? Well, there are a few different kinds of shareholder voting. We have straight voting, cumulative voting, and class voting. Straight voting is that one share, one vote. Cumulative voting is that each share gets one vote for each director. And they can, they can pile that all in one director or spread it around. So cumulative voting favors minority shareholders. Straight voting favors majority shareholders. Then we have class voting, which is that there can be different types of stock. There can be common stock, preferred stock. Preferred stock can come in different series, series A, series B. Class voting or series voting would say that each class of stock, so in class voting, the common, a majority of common would have to approve something and a majority of preferred, as opposed to simply all of the shares together approving something. So if you have 1 million common and 10 million preferred, without class voting, the preferred could dominate the common. Uh, with class voting, the common would essentially have a veto right over those transactions. With series voting, uh, the series A, let's say there's a million series A and 10 million series B, if it was merely class voting, uh, series A and B both being preferred would be dominated by the B, who has 10 million. Uh, but if you had series voting, the A would get a veto right, uh, even though they only have a million of 11 million preferred shares, uh, you would still need 500,001 series A shares to approve a transaction through series voting. So how do you go about creating a company? Well, here's a brief procedural checklist. So first you would file the certificate of incorporation with the Delaware Secretary of State, and at that point, you could also make the S election, which would create the company as a flow-through entity, so a corporation would not get corporate level taxation. Uh, then the, the incorporator will execute the written consent of the incorporator, the action of the incorporator, where the incorporator appoints the board and then resigns. The directors then create the organizational resolutions, which uh, is some either going to be at a meeting or by unanimous written consent, and it's a resolution, so it has to comply with Delaware law. At that point, the bylaws have been adopted, so you're going to be in general Delaware law. Uh, for looking at that approval. And then at that meeting, uh, or in those uh, in that unanimous consent, the bylaws will be adopted, and the bylaws are going to contain new rules about how the corporation will function. Uh, the secretary needs to certify that. Uh, then you'll go ahead and get what's called an employee identification number from the IRS. That allows the corporation to open a bank account and do other such things. You can execute the restrictive stock purchase agreement so that the founders can get their shares. And it's very important within 30 days of getting that restricted stock, if it's subject to vesting, to file what's called an 83B election. An 83B election is an IRS document that the founders need to send into the IRS. And it basically says that they're going to pay, uh, <clears throat> they're going to pay tax on the value of the shares now. And since the value now is what they paid for, they didn't receive any profits, so they owe zero tax. Alternatively, if you don't file an 83B, 
the founders essentially owe tax as the stock increases in price. And so they owe tax and they have an illiquid asset. So if the stock becomes very valuable, they could owe a very large amount of tax with no cash to pay it. So A3B elections are very important. And then the attorney will prepare stock certificates to document everything. So that's all you really need to know about forming a corporation uh, for purposes of this class. And thank you for your attention.